Hey everyone, welcome to Construction DEI Talks, a podcast where we will talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion as it relates to the construction industry. My name is Jorge Quesada, and I am the Vice President of Inclusive Diversity at Granite Construction. And joining me as co-hosts are Stephanie Roldan, Director of Lean Culture at Rosaden, and Abby Combs, Inclusive Diversity Partner at Granite Construction. On each episode, we're gonna open up the floor for conversations with subject matter experts about how we can make the industry a more diverse and inclusive place for everyone and make our industry stronger. Welcome back to another episode of the Construction DEI Talks podcast. As always, we want to thank our generous sponsors, Rosen and Granite Construction. And Jorge, who did you bring? Come on, share with the audience because this is, you know how to get some great guests. I don't know. I don't know if you're slapping 20s in the hands or what's going on here. You know, so let me tell you, we're on a streak here of guests that I have met in the last, I would say, last three years that have really made an impact, not only in the space that they work in, but also have challenged my thinking. And I thought, if we're gonna have a guest around diversity, equity, and inclusion, there is no better person to have on this podcast than Greg Jenkins. And I'll tell you why. First of all, he's a dedicated and passionate consultant, DEI consultant, practitioner, and lifelong learner. 20 eight plus years in the U.S. Army. And I want to make sure that we give this man his flowers, right, for his dedication and for his service, because 28 years, it's amazing. And it's ranged from overseas duties in Germany, South Korea. He's had combat duty in Iraq, and he's had some, you know, stateside assignments. And probably it culminates in him being in Washington, D.C., and serving in uniform, leading the military equal opportunity efforts. That then led Greg to get into his selection to the Army's Diversity Task Force at the Pentagon, which helped establish the Army's inaugural diversity program policies and products that they they gave. So when you hear about the military being probably one of the most diverse places You know, Greg was right there, right? He created that lab. He created all the language that was important. He has impacted 1.4 million soldiers, civilians, and their families in all of this work. And as a leader and facilitator, Greg is providing training, facilitation, and oversight over tens of thousands of people that have attended his training around DEI. Where I've got to know him is through an organization, the Inclusion Allies Coalition, So he served in various nonprofits and organizations and leadership positions. Greg, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Jorge. Your kind and generous words are are way too much. I'm, I'm very humbled. Thank you so much for having me on. We like to ask our guests, can you tell us a time when you felt different? Oh, yeah. One that I'll share very quickly here is when I was directed to participate in the Department of Defense in their training at the Defense Equal Opportunity Management Institute. You can condense into one acronym, DIOMI. And I was a very resistant individual going into the equal opportunity, diversity and inclusion space. But I went because I was a good soldier. And I was in the minority in that institute. And I could clearly feel, I did clearly feel different and out of place and not sure how I was going to be successful in a space that I really didn't want to go to initially. I felt different because I was older, white, straight, and male. And most of the people in that school were not that description. Mm. And so I remember getting the assignment. I had my, the unit that I was assigned to, we had re- returned from Iraq in 2004. And at the time I was, I was at 20 years, I was going to retire and move on to something else in my life. And then army said, no, we want you to go learn about these topics that I just mentioned and, and help be one of the leaders in the space. And my perception at the time, Jorge, was that, well, gee, you know, diversity, you know, equity and inclusion, those are programs for women and minorities. Why am I being subjected to this treatment. 
Mm. And so my initial perception was I was either I disappointed somebody or I was being punished or they were just trying to show me the door and maybe I'd just go ahead and retire in a way that they wanted me to and not in the, in the way not that I wanted to. All of that could have not been further from the truth. So once I got into that process and started to learn more about myself, learn about others, it really opened up my mind to some things that I had never even considered. And it really lit a passion to do this work. And I've been doing it ever since 2005, is which when I, uh, when I completed that, that initial training, if you will. So and, let uh, me ask you this then, what impact did it make on you and how you lived your life afterwards? I think the biggest impact and the one that I, I still think there's a huge impact from the DEI space today and one that I first started thinking about way back when was not only about learning more about myself and having to come to grips with that, my homophobia, my racism, my sexism, you know, the way I viewed people, how I had my levels of power and how not everybody has what I have. And I'm not saying that I have it all, but learning about more about myself was really a, an important starting point. And then I think the other thing was about leadership. And I remember going through that 16 weeks of in-resident you know, training and thinking to myself about halfway through, like, wow, this is such great leadership training. And that I wish I would have had this 15, 20 years earlier mm. when I would have been able to understand different people differently, be more aware of myself, be more aware of others and, and the trials and tribulations that they were going through that I never had to contend with. And I could have been a better leader and I could have served better. That is great insight because Tay and I actually built a program that started about a year ago. Tay, along with others, actually lead the programming. And a lot of it is focused to your point, Greg, on how this is leadership skills. Yep. We, for, we forget that it takes a lot of us to meet the goals and objectives we want to meet in organizations, to be profitable, to meet our customer service needs, to meet the very different customers we'll come across. And when you start looking through that leadership lens, I think that to your point, Greg, that's where it finally clicks like, this isn't punishment. This is actually going to make me a better leader. It's going to allow me to let those people that are serving be better leaders themselves. And thereby, you're actually building the culture that you'd like because everyone wants to be seen as a, as a great leader or as a person capable of leading. But we have to get over that hump to your point, Greg, of always feeling like when I got put in this class, somehow I'm being punished. Yes, exactly. And to be really honest with you right now, a lot of that resistance of me going initially going into that process, you could boil all the way down to just plain old fear. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to say it. So I'm not going to say anything at all. I was a senior leader in a, in a large organization. I had the power and privilege to avoid those difficult conversations. I could extract myself out of those, or those, those things that were uncomfortable for me because I don't have to talk about it. That's not my problem. This is the woman and minority problem. I don't have to be involved when, in fact, I do need to be involved. This is a people problem. This is a, or a people challenge or a people opportunity, right? If I understand myself better, I'll understand you better. We can understand each other better. And, oh, man, we can build better teams. You know, there's such an argument for this. And I, and I think a lot of it is, at least in my experience, it's a fear of I'm going to say the wrong thing. I'm going to do the wrong thing. I don't want to be perceived as racist or sexist. So I will avoid when, in fact, we could get you to a place where we could start to have those courageous conversations and start learning about self and others. Greg, how one of the first things you came out the gate with was you had to check your own biases first. You were like, well, now I don't want to be perceived as this and I have to check my sexism and my racism and my, and I was like, yes, because I think another thing a lot of people think that diversity is everyone's going to point out all the things that are wrong with you. When if you sit down and have a conversation, you might check yourself. Mm -hmm. So what is one of the, the key things you would tell someone going into that kind of space on how to best check themselves? I think the absolute first thing is we should acknowledge the fact that we are biased, period. And very often the perception that I discover is, well, I don't want to, I don't want to admit I have a bias because bias means bad. 
I'm here to tell you folks, bias is. We are creatures and we have bias. It's hardwired into us. Studies abound. There's even studies that show children as young as six months old preferring the faces of their own kind of face. It's like white babies preferring the faces of white adults, black babies preferring the faces of black adults. And it's not to suggest in any way, shape, or form that a six-month infant could possibly be racist. It's just this is the wiring that we we are born with that has kept our species alive for a long, long time. So these biases are inherent in us. And it doesn't mean that you're bad. It means you're a human being. So I, I think understanding those definitions, understanding those realities that this is the wiring and that's okay. Now that we understand that it is a fact of ourselves, how can we manage those biases? And that's the first thing I, I really like to make sure that we, we understand that we all got it. Now let's talk about how we can manage it. The perspective is so important from a bias perspective, but here you are as a white male being challenged to learn, being challenged to change, right? How do you have a conversation with other white males? I've had many conversations where another white male has asked me to step into the office and shut the door. And the question has been oftentimes, you know, do you really believe in this stuff? And I've learned that that's a really good doorway to go through mm. because they, they really want, they want to know, why are you doing this work now, Greg? Mm -hmm. I'm a little confused because you don't look the part, right? And so I always invite those as really good, really good, and I'll use the term again, doorways of, of getting in the conversation to go a little bit deeper. And my response is, well, yes, I do. I think these are facts of life. We are diverse. I mean, period, full stop. We can choose to be inclusive or exclusive to our detriment or benefit. And let's hear more about what your thoughts are other mm -hmm. white man who is asking me this question about why I'm in this space, because yep. I don't want to attack that person. I want to hear what their, per their perception is, because very often I am talking to the person who I was a formal self of. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because I, I can kind of relate to that guy because I kind of felt the same way in a lot of respects. Maybe that in a way is an advantage that I, I want to use for good courageous conversations. When was the epiphany that your voice was important in this conversation of DEI? I don't know if it was if it was one single event. I think it was just a, dis and a continual on-ramp of discovery that everybody's voice is important. And I remember it was a bumper sticker I saw years ago, speak up even if your voice shakes. And that's, of course, that's about, you know, you got you to gotta be courageous and say some things sometimes, you know. I think it's a realization as of coming out of 28 years in the United States Army, 25 of those, I was in a leadership position. So I was in charge of other human beings. And so inherently, I knew that a leader's words and actions carried tremendous levels of weight. I knew that intuitively going into DEI, if I promote diversity, equity, and inclusion, and then my behaviors are absolutely counter to what I just said. I mean, I think my favorite thing that you said was how you would be invited into a office by another white male yep. <laughs> who's like, do you really believe this? And I, I feel like that might have been one of the most impactful things that you're you're doing, because, again, most of them feel that this work should be done by women or people of color or, right. or a diverse group. And you are a white male out here doing the work that has helped you grow and, and benefit. And you're trying to help others grow and benefit who, again, if I walk into the room preaching this, they might be too afraid to even approach me mm -hmm. because of, again, biases or fear. But you are just like them. So you're my favorite kind of person <laughs> because you're in there. And I can be like, oh, well, why don't you go talk? Go talk to Greg. Greg, <laughs> Greg will fill you in. And, and do you feel like, just like you kind of said, that that's one of the biggest hurdles slash achievements you have is being able to reach your literal demographic? I think it's a distinct advantage. Absolutely. I mean, we all have affiliation bias. People like people like themselves. That's just who we are. You know, we could say, you know, that's that skin color or, or religion or language or culture or whatever. We could put, we could fill in those blanks. We like people like ourselves. And again, that goes back to the bias discussion we had just a few moments ago. We all have that. And I think that it's a distinct advantage 
when I'm talking to people that are white and male and, you know, cisgendered, you know, white males. But I would say the thing that I like to do, Tay, is like, for example, if you and I were working together and we were co-facilitating, oh man, what a great combo. Because now you have a man and a woman, one appears to be white, one appears to be black. They're working together well. And there's going to be things that I'm going to say to that group that are they're going to hear. And then there's going to be people that are, are then you're going to say you can the same message. And there's going to be other people that'll hear you better. You know what I'm saying? And so it's there's a lot of things. It shows that two very different looking people can work very well together. And I, I think there's a really significant positive psychological aspect going on when when groups of people see that happening versus if it was just me or just you. We both have those powers and privileges, Tay, no question about it, and the people that look like us. But you and I together working together, oh man, that's just even more powerful. Greg, why would the construction industry benefit or how can the construction benefit from a DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion practice? Well, I was in the construction industry right after high school. I was a general contractor, so I have a little bit of experience in that space. I think there's a number of reasons. I think there's there's a heart conversation, you know, your heart in your chest, there's a heart conversation and there's a head conversation. And I think if we just talked about the head conversation or the, or the argument, you know, from a business standpoint, I think there's a couple of important things to take a look at. So, we could look at internally within the organization, what, well, what does the workforce look like? Do you have enough people? Do you have, you have a turnover issue? Are you growing and need to hire more people, more talent? What does that look like? And where are you finding talent? Where do you attract and recruit from? Are there populations of people that you don't pursue or try to attract because of, for whatever reason, maybe you don't know anybody from those places. Maybe you're uncomfortable trying to recruit from groups of people that don't look like you. So I think from an internal standpoint, there can be great advantages if we're trying to build the internal organization, its culture, being more inclusive, more effective, so on and so forth. From an external standpoint, we're talking about your environment, your marketplace. Where do you do business? Who do you do business with? Who are your customers? Who are your clients? Who are your stakeholders? Who are your vendors? What does that constellation look like? Are you trying to grow in the marketplace? Who do you sell to now? Who would you like to invite in? You know, who do you want to build more things for? And I, so I, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a big argument there. If you just looked at demographics in the U.S., take a look at the most recent U.S. Census report. It came out in August of, of 2021. We have always been a shifting, changing demographic, and that has not slowed down at all. If you just look at two stats, and one of them is in 2010, 9 million Americans self-identified as two or more races in the census in 2010. That increased 276% in 10 years, from 9 million to 33.8 million. People who self-identify as two or more races. So we are deciding who we want to be with, who we want to make children with, marry, all those kinds of things. That's making a difference. If I'm a business and I'm not paying attention to that, I may not have a message that resonates as well if I continue to use the same messaging to one homogeneous group of people. Here's the second stat. In 2016, this is U.S. Census Bureau data as well. In 2016, there were 26 states where the white death rates were higher than the white birth rates. So you have a shrinking population of of white Americans and a growing population of everybody else, all people of color, two or more races, all those kinds of things. This is not nefarious or there's not some evil plan. It's just biology occurring. You're going to go to a certain age and then, you know, the oldest people in in the society will, will pass away. It happens everywhere. But I think going back to your question about the construction industry, If you want to be in business for a bunch more decades, I think you got to kind of take a step back and say, what's happening to the marketplace? What's happening to the society in which we want to serve and sell our goods and services to? So pretty good argument, I would think. So Jorge, I had a question, and I think he actually gave some of the data that was surrounding what my question was, which Mm -hmm. is, is in our industry, we're spending time talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. I think truthfully, the focus really needs to be, and Jorge and I have said this on this inclusion and belonging piece, because the truth is the diversity is going to happen without us. And exactly. it's, ha- it's, it's happening right now in this minute in the way that 
Gen Z is the most diverse generation that ever existed. And they're soon going to be joining or some of them actually have already joined the workforce. Mm -hmm. And so as they start adding and, you know, millennials are now becoming sort of the the larger group of who's managing the workplace. Mm -hmm. You bring in Z, it's not really whether or not you want to do it. It's whether or not you're prepared for the generations that are are coming because you have no choice to your point. If you want to be a business and you've been here a hundred years and you want to be here a hundred years more. Right. Who comes through that front door will be very different than who led the the first hundred years. Absolutely, Stephanie. And we were just talking about race. We're not talking about gender, sexual orientation, religious preference, national origin. I mean, you know, you can overlay a whole bunch of different characteristics that we just using one was just on on race. So when you start being more understanding of all those other differences, there are people in every population that want to be construction workers, men, women, white, black, brown, Asian, Native American, multiracial, biracial, and they're already in it. And there's going to be more. Why would we not want to take a step back and go, well, gee, we're doing OK, maybe. But what's 5, 10, 20, 30 years down the road going to look like? How are we going to be competitive? Greg, something that we do with all of our guests is we ask the three biggest questions we feel for you, which is what do you want people to be? What do you want people to know? And what do you want people to do? And you have brought up a lot of things today. So I feel like you have the best answer right now. Because <laughs> I'm changed. So great. <laughs> what would you want people to be? What would you want people to know? And what do you want people to do when it comes to the DEI space? Oh, Tay, I love your question. And I'm so glad it, it rings of my army experience because that was a be no do thing in the in the army as well. So B, I want people to be more inclusive. No, I want people to know more about themselves. Take some time to do some discovery. You'll enjoy it. I think you will. There, there may be some difficulties there, but know more about yourself. And the last one is I want you to do more of setting the example of inclusion, of respect and dignity for everybody. Thank you so much, Greg, for joining us on the show. We greatly appreciate you coming on, dropping some wisdom on us, getting us all to think a little bit differently. Uh, with that, we're going to close by thanking both Granite Construction and Rosenden for generously supporting our efforts to get the DEI discussion out into the construction industry and the world as a whole. Be inclusive. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of Construction DEI Talks, and we hope you'll join us for our next episode. If you'd like to learn more about how you can make the construction industry a better place to work, please visit our website or reach out to us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or Instagram. There you will find more information on the latest developments in diversity, equity, and inclusion. You can find our webpage and email address and links to social media in the show notes. We'd love to hear from you. So be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any future episodes. We'll catch you next time on Construction DEI Talks.